So in the last video, we did this problem using the indefinite integral method. We did the indefinite integral of the w, got our v, and of the v, they get our m. And every time we did that indefinite integral, we had a plus c, and we had to figure out that plus c, but once we had that plus c, we had the entire equation, and we could just use our graphing calculator to figure out all the known information about the v and m diagrams that we could want. Now this method will work all the time, but I've seen a lot of teachers teach it or present it in a different way such that you don't have to use your graphing calculator and that results in you plotting the curves a bit more quickly. But this technique is harder and sometimes it kind of falls short. So just know that the method we went through in the last video works all the time. It's a little tedious. It's a lot of calculator keystrokes, but it works all the time and it's straightforward. So in this video, we're going to use the definite integral technique. Remember, definite integral is just calculating the area under the curve with some set bounds of integration here. And doing this doesn't give us the equation for v, it gives us the change in v. So we'll use the definite integral area under the W curve, that's the loading curve, an area under the shear diagram, and we'll also make use of these facts too. And this technique uses a lot of Calc 1, that curve plotting section where you have to be able to graph a function from the graph of its derivative, and you'll see what I mean. So we'll pretend like we did our support reactions first, and we'll get started with our shear. So, the area under our loading curve. Well, remember, our loading curve, that W, is like this, negative 300, all the way up to x is equal to 1.5. So if we do that definite integral, if we calculate the area under this curve from 0 to 1.5, we're going to get a 1.5 times a negative 300. Remember, this is just a rectangle right here. So that's getting me a negative 450 for my change in V. So I know my V is going to start about right here at 737. And I know that its change is negative 450. So 737.5 minus 450 gets us a 287.5 right here and it's going to be a line connecting, a straight line connecting these two points. And I know that because W is basically a, a flat line so if I integrate a flat line what I'm going to get is a y is equal to mx plus b linear equation with negative slope. So that's how I know this is a line. Just know that I'm not worried about the plus c at all. I'm not worried about the perfect equation like we were in the last video. Alright, got that. So now I see that we have the 600. So I launch into that whole argument, okay, if I have this external 600 here, and here is my positive shear direction, this 600 happening here means that I really need more negative shear to fight against that. I don't need positive shear to fight against this for balance. I need this negative shear. I need shear in the negative direction, which means we're going to shoot downwards by a value of 600. So take that 287.5, subtract 600 off of it, that's a negative 312.5. That's going to be around here. Each one of my marks is 250. Okay, got that. Now for this range, my W is 0. So if I imagine plotting that, a W of 0 is just going to look like this. Area under this curve is a 0. So this whole thing is a zero, and therefore my shear doesn't change. 
And since it doesn't change at all, it's just going to keep at this constant value of negative 3, 1, 2 until we get to the end in which I have to perform my check. So here I am at my last cut at x is equal to 3. Here is this externally applied 3, 1, 2, 0.5. Because of this external load here, I'm going to need a lot more of my positive shear to balance it. So this external red 312 is going to cause our shear to shoot up in the positive direction by 312, which gets us back to V is equal to zero. So that's great. Shear seems to be correct. So yeah, notice how much faster this was. Now the, the downside is I don't have my equations here. I mean, this one's pretty easy. Uh, that's just V is equal to negative 312.5. But I don't have my equation here. Okay, so now for the moment. So I gotta calculate the area under my curve of my V graph. And of course I know that my M will start at zero, like we talked about in the last video. So area under my curve right here, well, different ways you can take that. You can either do the trapezoid formula, or you can split it up into a triangle and a rectangle. And I see a lot of the latter technique, just because everyone knows the areas for triangles and rectangles. So here's my triangle area. This right here is the height of this triangle, the difference between 737.5 and this 287. I also got one half, and this 1.5 here is going to be the length. And I have the area of the rectangle, length times my width, and that width is this 287. So all in all, we can do the math, add these areas up to get the total area under my v-curve, to calculate that change in my moment curve and crunch that out and we'll get a 768.75. So this is the area from 0 to 1.5. So my change from 0 to 1.5 will be a plus 768.75. Note that this area here is positive area. It is above my x-axis. So that'll put me right about here. Now, as for the curve connecting these two, I don't know the equation here, but I know it's some sort of y is equal to mx plus b, which means the antiderivative of that is going to be a parabola something with x squared, something that looks like this or like this. In this case, looking at our equation for v, and this is where the calc 1 really comes in, I know I have negative slope here, so I know that my bending moment equation will be concave downward, so it's going to be this option rather than this option. So even still, now that we know that, well, which part are we graphing? This part? This part? Well, definitely going to be this part because, as you can see, we are rising. So we got that. Well, there's still more questions. Is it going to be like this? Notice that I have a local max right here. Or am I basically plotting some sort of section before my local max? It's another question. So, here's the thing, and here's where the calc 1 really comes in. Remember, a local max means that the derivative of my m is 0. Well, don't forget these guys over here. The derivative of my m is my shear. This guy here, my v, is the derivative of this guy. If this guy is 0, that means I do indeed have one of these local max slash local mint. But notice, notice this. 
each one of my derivative values is positive. None of them are zero, which means apparently the section of the M that I want to graph here is only going to contain the positive slope locations, not that one local max or local min that I know every parabola must have. Every parabola will have one, exactly one, local max or local min. So because of all that, I know it's going to be like this. I don't want to do something like that because that implies that, hey, here's a local max, local min. And since I know my change over here, and I started at zero, I know that this point here is a 768.75. Hopefully you're beginning to realize this can get a little murky. You really got to be able to wield your calc 1 and derivatives and all that stuff pretty, pretty fluidly. Okay, next we get this, this, this drop here. Well, there's no area under this drop here. It's, it's thin, infinitesimally thin. So nothing going on here. So next I got to calculate my area here. Well, that's going to be easy. That's just a rectangle. Height is negative 312. Length is going to be 1.5. So if I crunch that math, I'll find out that my change in my moment curve should be a negative 468.75. Now, I realize I just made a mistake here. By calculating all this area from 1.5 to 3, I'm totally neglecting that here is this instantaneous couple moment. So, what I really need to do is calculate the area from here, 1.5, to here, 2.25. Because here is where that couple moment is applied at x is equal to 2.25. So I'll change my length, the distance in between this x is equal to 1.5 to x is equal to 2.25 is a 0.75, so I'll run that calculation again. That'll be a negative 234.375. So that is the area under the curve of this section. So therefore, I know that my moment will drop from here to somewhere around here. So I'm going to do that exactly. So 768.75 minus 234.375. That's a 534.375. So that's going to be around here. So here is 534.375. And the curve is going to be a line, a straight line. And the reason that I know that is because my V equation is, again, one of those constants. So if I do an antiderivative there, I know I'm getting a downward slope line. All right. So now here's this point applied couple moment going this way with a magnitude of 300. Here is my positive internal unknown bending moment. Because of this 300, I'm going to need bending moment going this way to fight against this purple. And that red direction is the direction of negative bending moment. So this is going to be a downwards shoot on my bending moment diagram, downwards by 300. So I'll do that 534, subtract 300 off of it. And now I'm at 234.375. That is right around here. 234.375. Okay. So again, this is all at x is equal to 2.25.
So now I got to take the rest of this area to calculate my final delta M. So I'll do that. That's going to be another rectangle whose length, well, what's the length of that? Well, this is 2.25. So what's this distance in between 2.25 and 3? Well, that distance is going to be a 0.75 multiplied by the height of this rectangle, which is still a negative 312.5. You'll math that out. And our final change in our moment will be a negative 234.375, which is really good because that's our change from this value. So if we go downwards by 234, by default that ends us up at zero. If I'm at positive 234 here, and we just learned that our change is negative, that changes us down to zero at the end. So that is great according to our final check. And again, this right here will be a line because this right here is one of those uh, constant equations like we talked about. So we were able to go through the V and M curves a lot more quickly because we're doing the definite integral. We're just going through the area, the areas underneath these curves to figure out the changes and then we do a little bit of anti-derivative work just to kind of piece together what the shape of those curves will be. But we do not have the exact equations for these guys. And in addition, you're going to have to tap into these as well to really figure out some of these more difficult curves like these uh, quadratic curves. So sometimes for harder problems than this, this method gets really hairy. But just remember, you can always fall back on the method of the last video. It always works. It's a little slower, but a lot more straightforward. So in the coming videos, we'll get some practice. And um, for each problem, we'll apply both methods, just so you guys will see both applied. I hope this video made sense. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments.